Hey, good morning, everyone. And I'm sure some of us are joining us from locations where it's well into the afternoon. So myself, I'm located in Oregon, but I just want to thank everyone for joining us today as we discuss taxes, more specifically tax planning for landlords and real estate investors. I know the end of the year, as we wrap up our accounting and the beginning of the year can be especially stressful for us as we head towards all of these upcoming tax deadlines. But if you think about it, CPAs and accountants, they have taxes on their mind all year around, and they're constantly thinking about strategies to help their clients perform better. And that's why we invited real estate tax experts, Amanda Hahn and Matt McFarland here today. Amanda and Matt, how are you guys doing? Great, Casey. Thanks for having us. I'm excited to be here. Thanks again for joining us. I know I'm excited to hear what you have to share, and I know all of our guests will find the information valuable as well. So I'm just going to give a quick background and introduction on you two before we jump into your presentation. Amanda Hahn and Matt McFarland are CPAs and tax strategists who specialize in helping people use real estate to save massive amounts in taxes and keep their hard-earned money. They help educate investors on how to maximize tax write-offs, legal entity strategies, tax-efficient ways to access profit, and how to use 401k money for real estate. They're the authors of the highly rated book, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. And they've been featured on prominent publications, including the Forbes Finance Council, Money Magazine, Talks at Google, CNBC's Smart Money Talk Radio, as well as the Bigger Pocket Podcast. Today, Amanda and Matt have helped thousands of investors nationwide save on taxes with this proactive tax planning. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Casey Miller. I'm the Director of Operations and Marketing for Rentec Direct's Property Management Software. And I'm also a real estate investor. We have about 20 properties in the single family and small multifamily space. And I know I'm particularly interested to hear what Amanda and Matt have to share. So we've invited our landlord and investor clients and friends here today to discover some tax tips and strategies as we head into the new year. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, amazing intro, Casey. And uh, welcome, everyone. We're so excited to be here because, like I said, taxes are top of mind right now for a lot of people. Um, and like Casey said, although we think about it all the, all time, the time, all the time, uh, this is the time when you guys are probably thinking about it a little bit more. So um, today we're going to talk about tax strategy specifically for real estate investors, landlords, and we're also going to talk about some uh, of the latest and greatest in tax changes um, or proposed changes today as well. So I think, yeah, good. I think everybody can see it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, Casey, for having us. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, we are kind of tax nerds, so we do love talking about this stuff. And uh, for full disclosure, uh, man and I are married to each other. So if I am making any weird jokes about, uh, you know, your spouse, then please don't get offended. So. <laughs> I'm talking to her. <laughs> yeah. Besides being CPAs, we are also real estate investors ourselves too. Um, and so, yeah, what I tell people is like, we're real estate investors by day and uh, CPAs by night. <laughs> or the other way around. By Sorry, day. CPAs yeah. by day, real estate investors by night. Um, All I know is that during the day I work for her and at night I work for her. Yeah, pretty much. That's what happens, right? So those of you, I know a lot of our investor clients are always like husband and wife teens too. So I think that's common. Uh in our world. Yeah. And our, our firm, Keystone CPA, we're based in Southern California, but we do work with uh, investors nationwide. Um, probably 85, 90% of our clients are involved in real estate uh, in some capacity. So kind of runs the gamut. We've got people, you know, let's say, you know, beginners for lack of a better term, right? They work at the W2 job, investing rentals on the side, runs the gamut to the, you know, full-fledged real estate investors who own apartments, doing syndication, fix and flips, all, all, all kind of all that good stuff. So I uh, love talking about tax planning, love helping investors kind of save more of your hard earned money, obviously. So hopefully you guys will get some good nuggets today. Yeah. For those of you curious about what we do in real estate, uh, our portfolio is mostly long-term rentals. Um, so from single family, small multifamily, we also invest passively in syndications as well um, of like apartments and self-storage, multiple parks, things like that. Uh, but yeah, on our own stuff, it's kind of the boring, typical, you know, long-term rentals that that uh, we're, we're all used to and love. So we wanted to start today with a quick pop quiz. To make sure everybody's paying attention. Uh, for those of you who know the answer, you can go ahead and put that into the Q&A box or the chat box. And um, 
Uh, it's just the fun little game we have. So the question is, which of the following celebrities went to prison for failing to file tax returns? So we got some good choices on here. We got Tim McGraw, Chris Tucker, Fat Joe, or Beyonce. <laughs> Well, let's see what people are putting into the question box real quick here. Uh, Wesley Snipes. Hey, guys, that's not even a choice. You're not following the instructions. Somebody's somebody's (laughs) heard us talk before, maybe. Uh, So, yes, we used to have this quiz many years ago was Wesley Snipes. So um, the correct answer is Fat Joe. For those of you who um, don't know who it is, Fat Joe is actually a rapper. Um, He got into some serious issues with not filing and paying his taxes, wound up in prison. And um, this quiz is not as simple as it might seem because actually all the people on this list uh, had tax troubles with the IRS. Um, But but Fat Joe was the only person who actually went to prison. Yeah, so Casey, just FYI, you got off easy because sometimes we'll we'll throw the... uh... The uh, ho- ho- post name on there is the. Uh, is oh no! <laughs> we like we like to spread vicious rumors about people and and uh, going to j- prison and stuff like that. So, um, so the reason that we wanted to share this, obviously, this is you know random facts that you don't really need to know for your taxes, but uh, this is our fun way of sharing our disclosure. Uh, and disclosure meaning that this, uh, what we talk about today is for educational purposes only. These are true strategies that we've worked with on our clients, but it does not mean these are strategies that will make sense for you. So if you hear something you like, make sure you run it by your tax advisor before implementing any of these because everyone's situation is different. Um, even if you're investing in the same complex, same type of property, uh, your personal scenario will play a big factor into which of these strategy or strategies might make sense for you. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, I think it's important why, you know, why we're here today is kind of to really understand the the power of what tax savings can do for you. Because, you know, believe it or not, in the uh, in the tax world in, you know, in America, there's two tax systems. Uh, you may have heard this before, one for the informed and one for the uninformed. And both are perfectly legal. Uh, and this is a quote from Justice Learned Hand, and that is actually his name. Um, but it's important to kind of see that if you kind of understand some of the nuances and some of the basic premises behind it and some of the strategies that you can take advantage of, you're going to be more on the informed side. And you're going to be able to take advantage and save some of those taxes, you know, build your wealth faster versus the uninformed where they're kind of just, you know, running through the day, just kind of doing what they've always done. And, you know, it comes to tax time. I just got to file my taxes and pay my taxes, right? Well, there's better ways to do that, right? So yeah, uh, that's why it's important. There's actually a um, an enterprise called the Tax Foundation dot uh, org. The, for those of you who are not tax nerds, you probably haven't heard of it, but it's a nonprofit that's been around since I think the 1930s. And what they do every year is they'll they'll run numbers and do analysis to see like how much are Americans losing to taxes every year. And what's surprising or not surprising is that the results year after year have been that average Americans lose more to taxes than we do on food, clothing, and housing combined. So if you think about it, it's you know, pretty scary because I think for, for average Americans, our housing costs is, is pretty big, right? Uh, but it's housing, clothing, and food all combined uh, is, is we pay more money to taxes than we do in all three of those. Now, obviously, as CPAs, like, inherently in our head we know that right but when we saw this like read that you know that kind of that article or what have you that where they kind of pointed that out it was still eye-opening to us right i mean because again you know your three of most people's biggest expenses food clothing and housing i mean that's you're paying more in taxes i mean that's 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 crazy to to, to most people right and, and here we're going to see kind of why is right um you know what are some of these taxes that we're paying obviously we got federal income taxes highest rate right now is 37 percent yeah, that doesn't mean you're paying every dollar 37% if you're in that bracket. It just means your next dollar. Uh, those of us lucky to live here in this great state of California, we can pay up to 13% in state income taxes. Some people may be a state, so you have zero income tax. If so, that's great, obviously. Um, you got payroll taxes. If you own your own business, you're working for yourself, you're paying payroll taxes at 15%. Real estate investors, we know. What do we pay when we sell properties? We got capital gains taxes. That can be up to 24%. And then if you happen to, to pass away without a good estate plan in place, you could be looking at the state taxes on the value of your appreciation of your assets of another 37%. So you can kind of see how this all adds together very quickly, right? Yeah. 
For those of you who like more of a pie chart, uh, a visual. And these are super technical pie charts, yeah. obviously. We put together this pie chart so you get the idea. This is for somebody who makes $500,000 a year. This is roughly how much they'll owe to federal, state, payroll, and investment taxes uh, on that income. So you can see how little is left right after we... we... So you're only left with a few of those dollar bills instead of 10 to Don't start think. with or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, too, what's, what, uh, what's missing from here are all the other taxes we pay that we didn't talk about, right? Whenever you go to Costco or the grocery store, you pay sales tax. Whenever you own real estate, whether it's your primary home or your rental properties, we also pay property taxes, right? So that eats more of that eats into the different taxes we pay. Um, and it's important to understand that because I think for most taxpayers, we're only thinking about taxes in April. And so we're always looking at it like, am I going to get a big refund? If so, I feel happy like I did good. If I don't get a big refund, maybe I feel sad I didn't do but that's not really indicative of how well we're doing in tax savings. What we really ought to look at it, I challenge you all to do this before you file your taxes this year, is look at the total tax liability on your tax return. The total is the amount that you're actually paying the IRS. That takes into effect like your withholdings and all that stuff, right? So don't just look at, did I get a refund or not? But really take a look at what's the total taxes you owe. Because if you think about it, right, a refund just means that you gave an interest-free loan to the government, right? That's money that you should have, you know, you were, you know, that was your money earlier in the year. You just waited until you filed your tax return to kind of, quote unquote, get it back. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, a lot of you here probably have heard the saying, more tax, the, you know, more income you make, the more taxes you pay, right? Your CPA probably told you that. We've heard other people say it. Um, and so it's really interesting that New York Times came out with an article a couple of years ago that talked about how these individuals were obviously very wealthy people. Uh, pay very little to no state income taxes. So being the tax nerds that Matt and I are, right, we were like, what are these strategies? Let's look into these it. super secret strategies that the uber wealthy get to use. Right? Yeah. So we took a look and what's really interesting is after cutting through all the, you know, kind of mumbo jumbo, the three main tax benefits that those people were able to use to reduce taxes are what you see here. We call them the three Ds, deductions, depreciation, and debt. And deduction, the article talks about how they were you know, able to write off their business expenses, which as investors, as landlords, we get to do. Uh, depreciation, right? In, in their world, it's like depreciating the assets for their business and taking a huge write-off. Well, as real estate investors, we also get depreciation, right? We might not have a bunch of assets, but we do have assets in the form of buildings and furnishings that we put in our buildings. Um, and then last but not least, the article talked about super wealth people using debt to save on taxes. Uh, which is something that we as real estate investors do all the time. When we use leverage our properties, we still get to take depreciation, which we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, um, I think that article is talking about how these, you know, obviously they're they're business owners. They probably own a lot of real estate too, but talking about how they they were using their business assets or their their assets, so they could tap into the equity of the assets and borrow money against it and kind of get that money tax free. And I was like, well, that's what real estate investors do all the time, right? And then it was talking about, oh, well, now they can deduct the interest of on that extra loan because they were using it to do A, B, and C. And it's like, that's exactly what real estate investors do because when you borrow that money and reinvest it into another rental property or you use it to build your business, you can deduct the interest because you're putting it into, you know, business or investment assets, right? So it's, yeah, it was kind of, it's kind of, we chuckled to ourselves when reading the articles like, okay, this is, this is all, no, this is all similar stuff that all, all of you guys can do as well. So I think that's good and bad, right? I mean, I think it was bad because we were a little bit disappointed. Like, well, we didn't learn any new strategies. So that was kind of sad. But the good part of it is just for us with the realization, like, you know what? They're using a lot of the same strategies that our clients are using, that we are using, right? It's just a, a difference in the numbers. You know, we're saving $10,000 or $100,000. They're saving $10 million or $100 million. But the core part, the core of what these strategies are, are very similar. And I would also say, you know, earlier we talked about the different tax brackets and, you know, tax rates you're paying. The higher income, okay, doesn't necessarily mean the more taxes you have to pay. With proper planning, you can pay less taxes. But normally, the higher income you have, the higher tax rate you'll be in, right? So if you make $500,000 or more, you're going to be at the 35 37%. If you make less, you might be at a 10 or 15% tax bracket. Um, and so when we talk about tax savings, we start with the foundation, which is making sure we maximize our tax deductions. For those of you with higher income and there are higher tax brackets, it's even more important to make sure we're tracking our expenses. Um, and I know the Rent Tech, you know, software does a really great job of helping you to track all of your property-related expenses. What we see missed the most, however, are some of these um, 
extra expenses, we'll call it, that are not really property specific, but we do incur them as part of being a yeah, real it's still estate stu- investor. It's still stuff that you're going to incur as, you know, like we call it overhead costs, right? You're, everyone's going to have these. You're going to have professional development. You guys are all part of organizations. You're going to conferences. You're you're paying money to kind of continue to build your skill set and your knowledge base and your training and so that you can grow your 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 rental portfolio business, your real estate business, whatever it is, right? You're you're paying this money. So those are going to be costs that you should be allowed to deduct. Um, business meals, right? You know, there probably a lot of people are going out to, uh, you know, going out to meals. They're talking about business, but they're not capturing all these expenses for, you know, a variety of reasons is what we see, right? They, I don't know, forget about it. They don't document it well. They didn't even know they could deduct it. Um, so just keep in mind, obviously, when you're, when you are going and paying money, for, you know, going out to eat, if you are talking about business immediately before, during, or after the meal, that can be a legitimate tax deduction. And you just want to document that and capture that expense. Mm-hmm. Business travel too is what we see missed a lot. Uh, Matt and I do a lot of education speaking, uh, you know, all over the U.S. And so we'll, you know, meet investors at, you know, different locations at conferences. And then later when we do their tax return, we're, you know, we won't see the, the the cost of that trip, you know, in the information they give us. Like, hey, I know you were in Orlando for the conference last year. How come I don't see it on here, right? So I don't see that expense on your financials. Yeah. Oh, you're trying to hide that expense from your spouse. <laughs> So just making sure that you track all of those things, because um, if you don't track them, you don't, you know, you don't give it to your tax person, odds are they're going to miss it, right? Even if it's us, we would miss it, except for the fact that we saw you there and we knew you were there. Um, So having a great system uh, to make sure you understand what are all these other non-property specific things that you can write off. And, you know, for right now, it's a little bit too late for us to strategize for last year's taxes. There's certain things we can do, but... Uh, for the most part, a lot of that is too late. We're really trying to plan proactively for 2024. However, uh, maximizing deductions for last year is absolutely something you could still do between now and the time you file your tax returns. Just go through your records again, make sure that you track all of these, you know, non-property specific expenses. I think another common one is home office. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if more than 50% of people in the United States are kind of working from home nowadays, obviously. Um, and so, if you are working from home and you have a dedicated office space that you're using to kind of manage your real estate, do your real estate business, um, you should be entitled to take the home office deduction. The benefit of, again, you know, we know if you have mortgages on your primary residence, you're deducting that. If you have property tax, you're deducting some or all of it, depending on where you live um, and how much you're paying. But the rest of the costs in your home, like your insurance, utilities, repairs, uh, monthly security, you know, things of that nature, um, the home office gives you the ability to take a, a write off or a percentage of those now that you couldn't deduct it before. You know, you're still, you know, still money you're already spending, but now we're trying to find ways to take deductions for it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, same thing for vehicles. For those of you who use a vehicle for your, your property, definitely make sure you're tracking the expenses and sending it to your tax person before tax time. Uh, I know there are a lot of confusion around, you know, can I only have car expenses if I have local rentals? What if all my properties are out of state? Well, the car expenses for your business is not only when you're driving to and from a rental property. There are a lot of other times when you have business miles that are not property specific, right? So you might be driving to meet with your CPA or your lender or your attorney about your real estate business. You might be going to Home Depot to pick up property, uh, pick up stuff for your properties. You might just be going to a local real estate meetup. Right. So just make sure you track those and give it to your tax person before you file your tax returns, because um, that's one of the, you know, another one of those things. And and with respect to the cars, you don't have to own your car in an LLC. We'll talk about legal entities in just a moment. But that's one probably most common question we get all the time. Like, I want to rent off my car. I drove it a lot, but I don't have an LLC. Right. That's OK. You don't have to have an LLC to claim business use of your car. And again, these are these are examples of things that you guys are probably already spending money on, right? But we're trying to find ways that to change that, convert it from being, you know, let's call it personal non-deductible expenses into at least some or a big majority of them now being deductible business expenses. Um, and so that's that's the that's the kind of the, the idea behind it. Now, the you know, along that same lines, another thing you should, guys could look at is how do we, um, you know, look at getting kids or other relatives involved in our business? Because- I think probably a common question we get a lot is, you know, can I deduct the money I give my kids? 
Uh, and you, you talk to, you know, 100 CPAs, 9 and I are probably going to tell you that you can't. But the better way to ask that question is how can I do that, right? Kind of shift your frame of mind, shift how you're thinking and asking the question. Um, so and, and the way to do that is, you know, if you can get your kids to help you in your business and pay them for the work that they're doing, you could take a tax deduction for it. And again, another example of, you know, those of you who have kids, we have kids, kids are expensive. You know, you're giving them money already as it is. So how can we change that from being non-deductible money to a deductible business expense? At the end of the day, they're still getting the same amount of money, right? Like maybe you're giving them $6,000 during the year for going out with their friends or whatever. Now you're paying them to work for you and then they can use that money to do the same thing, right? So um, as a family, again, if you're in you know 40% tax bracket, you pay your kids 10 grand, you're taking a $4,000 uh, you know, savings on that. They may not even have to pay any income taxes on it. So as a family, you could be saving $4,000 as a whole on the same exact money you were already giving them, right? Yeah, I think it's really important to also just mention, because we do get this question a lot, is like, you know, how old do my kids have to be for me to pay them? Um, the IRS doesn't actually have an age minimum or maximum, but they do require that the compensation you pay be reasonable for the task that they're doing. And so from a reasonableness perspective, you have to consider how old your kids are, what are their abilities? Does it match what you need done in your real estate business, right? Yeah, because you can see this kid on the screen here. I mean, he's old enough to be teaching his dad how to use chat GBT, right? So, <laughs> or just Zoom in general, Zoom, right? Maybe I, we yeah. had our we had our eleven year old teach us how to do some stuff in Zoom yeah. recently in Google Slides. Um, but of course, you know, obviously, like your three month old is is not going to be the one helping you with the Zoom. So, so we do want to be reasonable. And, you know, we have to also operate in the spirit of the law, right? The law is is intended for you to really have somebody help out in your business, paying them a reasonable compensation. It's not to say, well, let me just say I'm going to pay little Timmy, but I'm actually not going to have Timmy do anything. Uh, that's not what the intention it is, of it is. And also, too, we, you know, we want to set good examples for our kids, too, right? The, the part of it is not just tax savings, but teach them how to build wealth, teach them the concept of earning money. Yeah, because think about it. If they they take the you know and say that you pay them five thousand dollars, now you know if they're ten years old, whatever, they could turn around, open a Roth IRA because they've got earned income. They could put that five thousand dollars in a Roth. I mean, imagine the power of that letting that grow tax free for sixty, seventy years. I mean, that that's changing changing a generation, right? Yeah, I know. Question we get a lot on income shifting is like, okay, I I, I mean, my kids are old enough. They do a lot of stuff for me. I want to pay them, but I don't have a legal entity. Uh, so you don't have to have a legal entity in order to use this income shifting strategy. You just have to make sure that, uh, you know, again, they're old enough to do whatever it is that you want them to do. Oh, sorry. Did some light turn off just now <laughs> in here? It got darker all of a sudden. Um, so that's, those are the things you don't need to have a legal entity. And on that topic, um, actually all of the deductions that we've talked about so far today are available for you regardless of whether you have a legal entity or not. And so so that means that, you know, car, home office, business travel, all those things you're able to write off with or without a legal entity. The entity itself, um, generally for landlords, is for asset protection purposes. So you'll have one because or if your attorney feels like that'll help protect you. The one main thing I would say from an entity structuring perspective is is probably just, you know, don't have S corporations hold your rentals. Yes, that's a big one. Don't don't use S corps hold rentals. Uh if you are anyone out there that was kind of has a property management business uh on that side of things where you're doing more act getting more active income, that's where looking at using maybe an S corp or where some circumstances a C corp might even make sense uh to run that business through. But yeah, purely from a from a, if we're talking about, you know, you've got your rental properties, you're a landlord, and do I need a legal entity to take tax deductions? The answer is absolutely not. The legal entity is there for asset protection reasons only. Still a good idea, obviously, to protect yourself from potential lawsuits and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that kind of helps answer, I think, a lot of frequently asked questions we get. Yeah. So I have a, I put a QR code on here and, you know, you can scan it if you want, or you can just wait till the end. I'll show it again. And my 12 year old told me that's what a, that's what a QR code looks the like. QR code. Um, uh, so we have a tax savings toolkit that you can download from our website uh, anytime anyone can do it. You can get it for free. Um, one of our resources is the whole is around the whole concept of entity structure. And we go through like, hey, if you're not sure what kind of entity you should have, um, here are a set of questions to ask yourself. Um, and, and I, you know, just a, a tip, I would stay away from anyone that tells you a one size fits all solution, right? Like all all investors should have an LLC in Wyoming. 
owned by, you know, you and a management C corporation, always stay away from advice like that because just like in the tax world, asset protection is also not one size fits all. So what might work for someone else may or may not work for you. Um, but what we try to do in our free tax savings toolkit is we try to help people understand, like, what are some of the things I need to answer myself first before I talk to an attorney so that they can help me determine the best type of entity? Because uh, let's face it, right? Legal uh, legal service is not cheap, right? So if you if you can figure out the answers of what you, what you need to know yourself first, um, then it's much easier for you to have that conversation. Some of the things are like, who else is involved? What's my exit strategy? How long do I plan to hold my real estate for? Um, what type of income are you making? You know, yeah, uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, so that's kind of what we want. You know, that's kind of the level of we we think you know help you to have that better conversation. All right, so we can't talk about real estate without talking about depreciation. Uh, that Matt calls the seventh or eighth. I call it the ninth, but then the someone ninth. reminded me that it actually would be the eighth wonder uh, or something like that. Right. So, anyway, uh, a top wonder. Of the yes. World. So big wonder. <laughs> So what we, I mean, we love depreciation. Um, I think most of you here probably already know what that is, but just real briefly, right? Depreciation is where IRS allows us to, to, to write off part of the purchase price of the building of a property over the life of the property. And this is because, you know, their understanding is that the property will have a wear and tear. So every year we'll write off a little bit of the building on our tax return. Um, generally, residential real estate is going to be 27 and a half years. Commercial property is going to be 39 years. An important distinction to make is for apartment owners or people with, you know, larger multifamily over four doors, even though they are commercial loans, they are still residential real estate for tax purposes. So usually we depreciate over 27 and a half years. I saw some people's minds going. Yeah, I know we do get that question. Right. <laughs> like I'm a commercial investor, I own apartments. Now maybe, you know, we may be preaching the choir here, right? But, you know, why, why do we love this, right? Why do we love this from a tax planning perspective? Like, you know, think about you would go out and buy stock. We don't, you know, you pay fifty thousand dollars for stock. You're not writing off the cost of the stock. You don't get to depreciate that. You don't even get to write that off until you sell the stock down the road. But with rental real estate, obviously, the goal here is we got there. We're earning positive cash flow, and then utilizing some of these tax strategies we've been talking about: maximize reductions, income shifting, maximizing the depreciation. The goal is to kind of get that cash flow, at the very least, down to zero, so we've got money in our pocket. We're not having to pay taxes on it right now, right? That's the beauty of and why we love depreciation. Yeah. Um, on the topic of depreciation, we do have some breaking news to share with you guys, some good news for those of you who haven't heard already. Uh, I think about two days ago, uh, the the tax people in Congress from both sides of the aisle came together and agreed upon a new act uh, in the proposal. And the proposal is to bring back 100% bonus depreciation retroactive to 2023. So for those of you who've purchased real estate properties in 2023 and placed them in service, those properties may be eligible for 100% bonus depreciation if this were to be enacted. Um, so, and, and also the proposal would actually bring 100% bonus depreciation to 2026 as well. So the current law is, you know, last year we have 80% bonus depreciation. This year we have 60%. So it's a, it's a pretty significant change if they were to make it 100% for you know last year as well as this year. Um, now, it nothing has been signed <laughs> into law yet. So don't, don't send us any hate mail. If, uh, don't celebrate. <laughs> um, um, so it's a little, bit, a, little bit, a little bit early to celebrate, but um, I think it's, it's a really good move in the right direction. All signs are pointing towards you know moving that direction for sure. Yeah. I think people have said like, well, what does that mean? Like, so it may happen, may not happen. What does that mean for me as an investor? Um, I would say, obviously, we're on the cusp of getting our tax returns filed. So um, our suggestion to our clients is, hey, you continue to gather your information and send it to us. We'll want to start working on the tax returns regardless. Um, but we probably don't want to submit anything with the IRS until we have final clarity on whether this is going to pass or not pass. Because we don't want to follow return using 80% bonus depreciation if two weeks, three weeks, or a month down the road, they're going to come back and say, ah, you get it. It's 100%. And then we have to go back and do amended returns. Right. So that's what we recommended, you know, in the off chance that they don't even pass anything um, uh, and we're still uncertain as of April 15th, you can always consider filing an extension too. So those are kind of the two latest and greatest in, in um, potential tax changes on depreciation. Yeah, and keep in mind that that, that would uh, could call could apply to, you know, properties where you have five-year assets or 15-year assets or seven-year assets. So those are the ones that typically are eligible for bonus depreciation. 
But uh, again, the, you know, this can add up. So you're doing land improvements, fixing your asset. I mean, you're spending fifty thousand dollars. Maybe before you were going to get the write off forty thousand dollars. Now you're going to get the write off fifty thousand dollars all at once, right? So it can make a, it can make a huge swing in your taxes. Yeah, for those of you who are property management company owners, you know, definitely something to share with your uh, clients too. I think it's going to be a really great value add. And for those of you who are doing cost segregation, we talk about cost segregation. We have not talked. Okay. About so, well, for those of you who are doing accelerated depreciation on cost segregation, too, that's another one to hold off on getting that completed because it clearly will make a difference in how much the tax benefit's going to be. Now, remember, obviously, for depreciation, um, you know, some of you may know this, but important to kind of point out, we've got a little example we can kind of show the power of this, right? Is when you're looking at de uh, depreciation, the starting point is going to be based on your purchase price, okay? So, it's going to be based on the purchase price and not necessarily what your down payment was. So an example, let's say you have $100,000 to invest, got a couple options here, right? You can use $100,000 to buy a property all cash. In that example, you may with accelerated depreciation, bonus depreciation, maybe get $20,000 in depreciation the first year. Still good. Um, still going to help you for sure. Uh, alternative might be use that $100,000 to buy a $500,000 property. And then that example, all, all facts the same, you could actually get up to $125,000 depreciation expense because now we're buying a $500,000 property instead of a $100,000 property, but you're using the same down payment. Uh, you know, fast forward, it could be an extreme example. Maybe you use no money down and you buy that $500,000 property. Maybe you get seller financing. Maybe you got, you know, a friend lent you the money as a second second lender, whatever the case might be. Again, it's based on the purchase price. So that example, you still get $125,000 of depreciation, even though you didn't use any money down, right? So um, really, really good distinction to make sure you understand because that can make a huge difference in your tax planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is an example of how earlier we we're saying how the truly wealthy people save on taxes, right? That's an example. Like they're just using debt. They're, they're not selling assets. They're borrowing from one asset class, using it to invest in another class, taking depreciation on their business or on their real estate, and just continue that circle of using other people's money and using the tax law to their advantage, right? All right, so I think the next slide we already talked about, are they bringing back bonus depreciation? We don't know, but the signs are looking good. Um, retirement accounts is kind of the last topic we'll be covering today. So, uh, you know, retirement accounts are a really great way, obviously, for us to save on taxes. For some of you, you may still be able to fund retirement accounts um, before you file tax returns for 2023 and still save on taxes for last year. Uh, this will be probably, I mean, you know, obviously if you have earned income, right, you can open an IRA or a Roth IRA and make contributions into it. Um, so you'll save, you know, I mean, you'll be able to contribute like $6,000 or so into the account, right, which will be good. Um, but for those of you who have active income, whether it's, you know, you have a, a business that you're, um, you know, consulting business, you're a professional services provider, you are a realtor, broker, property management company owner, right? These are uh, all scenarios where retirement account planning could potentially be a very significant way to save on taxes. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of options there, especially when you own your own business. I mean, there's 401ks you can do. There's SEP IRAs. There's solo 401ks if you have no employees. There's even defined benefit plans that can work with the right client profile, the right taxpayer profile. That can be a huge way to put, and you know, we've seen, people with defined benefit put one hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 away into retirement every year. And that can be, you know, again, if you're in 40% tax bracket, that could be a huge tax savings, right? So a lot of these, a lot of these plans, you still, have, again, still have the ability to kind of open them for last year and still fund them for last year. So early we're talking about, yeah, obviously when you get to April, and we're talking about last year, there's not a lot you can still do, but this is one of those things that there's maybe it'll be some opportunities. So definitely look into this before filing your taxes because you know, sometimes people just have that kind of tunnel vision of like, oh, I can do the $6,000 traditional or to a Roth. And they're not thinking about the other things, right? Yeah. If you're a solo, I mean, if you're a sole business owner with no other employees besides you and your wife or you and your partners, uh, then solo 401k is a really great way to contribute uh, a lot of money. And like Matt said, it could be a solo K uh, combined with a pension or defined benefit plan and be able to stack away a lot of money. If you are a property management company with a lot of employees, then you're looking at more of a traditional 401k. But again, you can also add in a defined benefit plan on top of it. Um, and depending on your profile, you could fund a lot of money into retirement and get tax savings. But I think because our clients are real estate investors, there's always a struggle of like, 
I love to put money away to real uh, into retirement, but I want to also use it for real estate. So I'm not sure which way I want to go. The beauty of it is that with self-directed investing, you can get the best of both worlds where you put money into an IRA or a 401k and then within that account, use it for real estate as well. Um, we won't go too in depth into it because that's almost like an eight hour topic that we talk a lot about, uh, but just something to discuss with your tax person before you file your tax return, right? If you don't like the, the the result that they give you, you can say, hey, talk to me about retirement accounts. What kind of accounts can I still set up and then put my money in? Um, and then you kind of go through the analysis and see what else is possible. All right. So I want to just like, and we talked about a lot of different things. I wanted to run over like a really, really quick uh, client scenario, just so you can kind of see how this, when you put it all together, what that means. Um, because, you know, otherwise it's just a bunch of little, little different strategies. So this is somebody that we worked with, uh, gosh, a year, two years ago now. Uh, so it's a married couple with high W-2 income. We'll call her Casey. <laughs> no. Sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> no. uh, so, so, so this married couple, they have uh, made about three hundred forty-five thousand of income. They had a working, uh, working spouse, and the other spouse was a, a someone who just worked on their real estate full time. And in this scenario, first time investing in real estate, they had one rental property. These were the rental net rental income that they got in that first year. So, really, really good uh, numbers. So they rented. This was actually like a midterm corporate type of rental that they had. So they did some income shifting with their kids. Nothing super crazy. They had two kids who were, um, you know, like around 10 or 11 at the time, I want to say. Now they're in their teens. And so they did a little bit of income shifting, started tracking their car and home office expenses, um, had some expenses from there. And the big one for them was depreciation. This was when, in the year when we had 100% bonus depreciation. So this, I think, was on an $800,000, like eight, eight something, between eight and $900,000 property. That was the depreciation they received. And so you can see their income went from 370 some thousand between W2 and rental, uh, went all the way down to 97,000. And so that's over $277,000 in reduction of total income with the proper planning in putting together all the concepts that we just talked about here today, right? So again, I think little by little, kind of like, well, home office is little, car is little, but when you put everything together, you can see how it all adds up. Yeah, and see, they didn't have to. They didn't have to, you know, fall for the spouse's trick. Do you need to go out and buy a brand new Tesla or anything like that? You know, they didn't. They didn't fall for all. They that. didn't fall for all this. No. <laughs> oh, all right. You you're, you're still you're, you're yeah, stuck on my my. Uh, yeah, I'm like, are you you're still about it? Yeah, yeah. About the Tesla. All right. <laughs> Okay. Um, this is, I think this is probably the most common and costly tax mistake that we see people make. Um, yeah. There's, it, you know, especially this time of year, right? You're going in, you're, you're sitting down with your tax advisor, tax preparer, and you're getting your tax returns done. And you're kind of thinking like, Hey, well, I, this person knows my stuff, right? They work with me. They work with me for X number of years. Um, obviously they're going to provide me with tax planning and tax strategies specific to my situation. But unfortunately, uh, based on our experience, what we see in the industry and what we've seen from talking to clients over 20 years is that that doesn't happen, unfortunately, is because what what happens is when you get in the thick of tax season, I mean, and we know this because we are, we do prepare tax returns. You're, you get in the mindset of we're preparing tax returns, right? But they're not thinking strategically and not thinking about what's happening in the future. So you want to make sure that um, understanding that doing tax return filing is not the same thing as doing proactive tax planning. You want to make sure you're doing both. Obviously, you want to make sure you need to file your tax returns, but you want to make sure you're working with somebody that can help you on a proactive basis to think about, ask the right questions like, what, what is coming up? What are you going to be investing in? Um, are you selling properties? And you know, if so, is there ways that we can strategize on what to do there to minimize taxes? Um, you know, kind of understanding it holistically, the, you know, basically the whole picture. Yeah. I feel one of the most important things we tell our clients or like we try to train our clients on is like call us all the time. Uh, so I think a lot of clients are really good at that. I just talked to someone this morning. He was telling me about his plan for 2025. Uh, and so, yeah, I think you really train your mind to always be forward thinking. And then whenever you're doing planning, to just make sure you connect with your tax person so that they know what's going on uh, instead of after the fact, like, hey, I sold a bunch of property last year. How do I save taxes? Uh, and so don't be that person. Um, so, all right, so we're going to head over to the Q&A. And um, I just put a QR code up here, the same one as before. Uh, basically, if you want to know more about tax savings, if you want to know any more about 
like entity structuring. Um, we didn't talk about short-term rentals because I don't know if any of you guys do actually invest in short-term rentals or are interested in a lot of different tax strategies for short-term rentals. Um, and so, yeah, you can just uh, scan the QR code there to access our tax savings toolkit. And with that, I'll hand it over back to Casey to do the Q&A. Well, thanks again, Amanda and Matt. That was a lot of inf information. We got a lot of questions as well. Um, and then for this um, toolkit also, I'll make sure to share a link with everyone too so they can access it if they're not able to grab that QR code. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through some questions that came through. And if we don't get have time for all the questions, I'll make sure to um, take a note of them so we can message people directly for them. So, okay. Um, Trisha is wondering, I've been hearing a lot about putting your investments in trusts or land trusts. Is this a good decision and how does it work? Good question, Trish. So, um, yeah, a lot of times when you hear the term land trust, um, the, the idea or the benefit of land trust is it's supposed to provide you with some sort of a privacy. So a typical scenario you might see is you've got, uh, you know, if you're looking at like an org chart or you got the property down here. The owner of the property is a land trust. The beneficial owner of the land trust is like an LLC that provides you asset protection. And then you or your kind of living trust is set up as the owner of the LLC. So it's it's kind of a runs that gamut. Um, land trust, again, can provide some privacy, you know, make it harder for attorneys to kind of find out who the ultimate owner is. Um, but they don't they don't actually provide any asset protection at all. Uh, another thing is land trusts don't change anything from an income tax perspective. Usually they're disregarded. They're kind of ignored. So if the land trust owns the rental. You're still reporting the rental on your personal return. So land trust is for privacy. LLC is in that example, typically for asset protection reasons. Okay. And then you kind of touched on this already, but Jean is, was asking about investing in real estate with an IRA. And so where would someone go to find more information on how to do that? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, we do talk about that a bit in our tax savings toolkit uh, about, you know, self-directed investing. Um, Matt and I wrote a book called Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. You can find that on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. Good nighttime reading. Yeah. And we talk uh, a lot more in depth about self-directed investing. But um, I would also check out, you know, there are a lot of self-directed investing companies like New Direct IRA Services, Equity Trust. They have a lot of um, resources on their website as well about what you can and cannot do. But absolutely, IRAs, Roth IRAs, SEP IRAs, um, 401ks even could potentially be invested in real estate. I think the easiest way to explain it is, you know, IRS doesn't care what your retirement money invests in. Right. They're not saying it has to be in the stock market or mutual funds. They're like, it's, you know, anything is it really is possible. Um, but what people get tripped up is they'll call their IRA company like Fidelity or Wells Fargo and they'll say, hey, I heard Matt and Amanda say I could use this to buy real estate. And they're going to say, mm, well, yeah, you can, but you have to take it out as distributions, pay taxes and penalties on it. And it's really important to understand that when they tell you that, all they're saying is that they cannot help you to invest in real estate. So through Wells Fargo, you can't go to the Wells Fargo IRA and invest in real estate, or Fidelity is not going to allow you to invest in a, a property on Main Street. But you absolutely can roll that money over from Fidelity to a self-directed custodian. And once it's in the self-directed custodian, you can go out and buy real estate. And this is done tax-free, penalty-free all the time. And I think a lot of our clients do that because to them, they they understand real estate, right? They, they, they get it. They... They know that, you know how to make money in real estate. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it's a better potential return on investment than leaving it inside of a, you know, Wells Fargo account where someone else is controlling it and, you know, may make some money on a mutual fund or not, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely find that strategy super interesting. Um, so we have um so Norbert, who's one of our long term clients, was asking about your experience with Rentech Direct um and then what other software you might recommend. Um, and I will share with Norbert too, we actually got in touch with Amanda because um, she reached out to us and Nathan, our developer and our owner is currently developing assets and liabilities. So we asked Amanda to actually check out Rentech Direct software and let us know what areas we could continue to develop to support this type of accounting. So again, thank you for that. And I'm so excited about the relationship. We we're able to glean from it and continue it on with this ongoing education for our clients as well. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. You're right. I re- I actually reached out uh, to Nathan, <laughs> um, you know, because because the the majority of our clients are real estate investors. So I'm always trying to figure out like what is the simplest way for them to to track expenses. You know, I do think it's it's one of the big headaches of investors uh, nationwide. Uh, we call it the bad B word almost like bookkeeping. Everyone likes to talk about tax savings. When you talk to people about bookkeeping, they just don't want to hear it. Um, and so I started checking out Rent Tax Direct and like, oh, well, it's already part of the software and we can kind of get, if we can get all the information from it and that's amazing. We don't want them to then regurgitate that information into something like QuickBooks or uh, Stessa or something like that. Right. So that was the reason uh, that I started talking to Nathan in the beginning. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm really excited about kind of helping to look at all that. You know, a question, the, the, your question about which software is good for bookkeeping purposes um, I always tell the, you know, I always tell our clients, it's, it's going to be with the system that works best for you. If you're doing your own bookkeeping, if you have a bookkeeper, it's going to be whatever system or software works best for your bookkeeper. Why? Because I could really love rent type direct, but if you don't like it and you're not going to use it, then you're just not going to use it and it's going to be blank. And, and, or if I like QuickBooks, but you really don't want to learn that software, then what's going to happen is you're going to buy QuickBooks and you're not going to touch it for a year. And now we have a major issue in January. So you know, it's just up to what your preference is. Some people just like Excel. Some people like to write things down, even though we don't recommend it. But some people still do have We, we do not recommend that. Just want to make sure that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I do not like that. Yeah. So it's, I, I think it's a matter of not like what your CPA wants. So the question for your CPA is how, how do you want things to track, right? So you have multiple properties. We need a property by property. And we want something with your overhead expenses that are not property specific. But whether it's in Excel or this software, that software it doesn't work. Excellent. Well, I always say there's space for different programs out there. So I appreciate your answer. It's about what you're going to use and understand as well and work with your CPA. So um, I did have a question that I'm going to actually answer just so everyone can hear the answer as well. So Deanne was saying that Rintec Direct currently categorizes owner distributions as an expense. Um, and I thought owner distributions were generally an equity account. And so um I just wanted to provide an answer to that with our current system. So the software does support income and expenses, but it doesn't support equity accounts. But good news, as I just mentioned, um, we have a big update coming to you, which is going to add equity, assets, and liabilities. So we will be allow people to be able to reclassify them as an equity account in the near future. Um, but in the meantime, we suggest creating this in other category. So um, these owner distributions don't show up on the income and expense report. So if anyone ever has questions about how to accomplish an accounting task in the software, I always say um, contact our success team. We love helping you guys out with those accounting tasks. So and assets and liabilities, full feature to crowding coming soon. So we're really excited about that. That's awesome. Um, okay. So our whole is asking, say, I purchased a residential investment property as part of a 1031 exchange in July of 2021. It's been used as a rental property since then. If I move into the property in July of 2024 and use it as my primary residence for two years, can I reduce capital gains taxes? Okay, so bought a rental property July 21 as part of an exchange. So obviously it would imply you had a rental property before that. Rented it out for three years, considering moving into it for two years. Um if you later sell it after that two-year period, you'd be able to. You'd be able to. The gain. Some of the gain might be eligible for the exclusion, the primary residence exclusion you're you're alluding to. But some of it's going to be kind of rental property gain that is not going to be eligible for that exclusion. So yeah, you kind of have to run through the math. But. Yeah, the way it works is when you turn a rental into a primary. You can use the primary home gain exclusion, but it's a prorated amount based on how many years was it a rental versus how many years was your primary home. So in this scenario, you might be able to, I mean, you know, I don't know the, the the years prior to the 1031, but that's that. But that gets, but that gets added on though. Yeah. So the previous, the initial property you sold to buy this property, that's also rental years. So, you know, in an example, this might be like, well, Based on rental years versus primary home years, it might be like twenty percent of my gain would be under the you know primary gain exclusion. So not the end of the world, but you know just not like super good. If your gain is big, I, I would still maybe consider doing that. Uh, but the good news is there's no restriction that says you can't move into it. 
right? So certainly it's been a couple of years. Now you can move into it if you want. Um, what we see more frequent is a, a, a primary home turned into a rental. So if you live in your home for two years, you turn into a rental, uh, you can rent it for up to three years and still exclude up to 100% of that gain. So there's not a proration. Up to the, use the entire exclusion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can, uh, yeah, of the exclusion. So, so if you have a primary turn rental, you don't have to prorate for a lesser gain. If it's a rental to a primary, you have to prorate. No rhyme or reason, guys. This is this is this is why taxes are just crazy. You feel like why? <laughs> yeah, don't ask, don't ask why. Um, so, and another question from our hole is: If a tenant vacates the lease early and you're unable to re-rent the property for the remaining of the lease, can you write this loss of rental income off? If so, how? Most rent, most landlords are cash basis taxpayers, which means that we don't report the income until we actually receive it. So assuming you are one of the, you know, the majority of people, then what happens is when you have a vacant property, you you just have zero income, right? You're still writing off your expenses, my holding costs, my property tax, my insurance. I'm still writing those off. So I have a negative, I'll have a loss for that month uh, and my income will just be zero. I wouldn't have a negative income because... You know, there there was no income. It's just going to be zero. Now, alternatively, if you're like an accrual basis taxpayer and you somehow already showed a thousand dollars of income and you ended up not collecting it, then of course you would have an expense so that your income would net to zero. Right? But that's how it typically works. Okay. And then um, from Jay, he's asking for an app that tracks receipts and mileages that you might recommend. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a good one for uh, on the car side of things that I can think of is uh, one called Mile IQ. I think that's one that, uh, you know, a lot of our clients have used, and I've, I've heard that it's uh, pretty user-friendly and a, and a good app. Uh, I can't claim to be a technical expert by any stretch of the imagination, mm-hmm. but um, for tracking receipts. Um, I'll tell you my method, um, which is probably like a dinosaur method, but... Uh... So whenever I have work or business related expenses, I take a picture on my phone and then I just throw it into a receipts folder on my phone. And then every so often I just, you know, have someone help me download it into my, my server. Uh, and, and that's the extent of it because I don't, you know, I don't really spend a lot of time organizing the receipts because it's really just there. Like if you ever needed it for audit or for bookkeeping, right? So, so that's not really an app. It's just, you know, get my, my like non-tech. But I think, I, I think the takeaway there, there's some people may not know. You know, you don't have to keep physical copies of receipts anymore. So the IRS will allow you to use digital copies, pictures, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and yeah, keep that on your you know computer, your server, and that'll be your backup. And then um, Shay is asking, she said that you mentioned a nonprofit that looks into the tax breakdowns for average Americans. Um, she was curious what that nonprofit was. Yeah, it's All called- right, another tax nerd. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's called tax. <laughs> It's called Tax Foundation. So I think the website is like taxfoundation.org. Yeah. And it's like a really cool website. Um, it's it's non-political, or I think that's what it's supposed to be at least. But they just talk about, I mean, I don't know. It's interesting for me. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. You're, you might be overselling it. Like the stats, <laughs> you know, like, no. we, you know, we've raised this much money and this is what it was used for. I'm like, didn't know that. Excellent. And then we have a, quite a few questions about um, the income shifting. So how would you report a 16 or 17 year old's income? Would they have to file their own return? And I'm going to kind of loop this in with another question um, saying what do they need to W-2 or 1099? Those are common questions. So whether you pay them as a W-2 or 1099 will depend on uh, what they're doing. So, you know, paying your kids is the same as paying anybody else, right? If I hired Casey, should I pay her as a 1099 or W-2? I have to go through that set of rules with my CPA. So some of the things your CPA will talk to you about is like, well, is a recurring work? Like, you know, is your child coming into an office every day, using your equipment, doing the same thing? Or is it a one-off? Like I'm hiring Casey to help me with social media marketing project. And then she's in and out. So that will help you determine whether it's 1099 or W-2 for your kids. Um, whether they need to report it as income will depend on how much money they make. Um, and if you withheld anything. So if you're paying them a W-2 and, you know, it's less than 13000 this year and you didn't withhold any income taxes, then they don't have to file a return because there's no taxes due. But if you paid them more or if you've withheld money as part of that payroll, then they want, you know, they might be required to file or they might want to file anyway just to get that refund back. So um, 
first step is to say which one is it are they acting like a contractor or are they acting as an employee that will determine how you pay okay and i think that kind of rolls into this other question we have from jeremy where um so do the kids then have to report the income and pay taxes on it is there an amount that you can give as a gift and deduct from your taxes and then um as an added bonus with the kids and Oh, if it was a bonus, but the kids don't have to report an income. So you mentioned that thirteen thousand threshold. Is that kind of where it falls on? Yeah. So like the the reason that threshold that's that's basically the standard deduction for most individuals on their taxes. So basically, if they make up to thirteen thousand dollars, they're going to use the thirteen thousand dollar write off. It's going to zero out. They're not going to owe any income taxes. Um, the the question about the gift, like you know, I give money to my kid. When we give money to somebody else, whether it's a kid, anybody, you know, as a gift is not tax deductible. So this is this is a difference, right? We're we're not making a gift. We're hiring somebody. They're working. We're paying them for work. So you're taking a deduction for it because they're an employee or contractor working for your business. They theoretically have to include it in income. But again, if they're under thirteen thousand dollars, there's if there was no income tax withheld, no reason to file because you're not going to get anything. You're not getting any money back. You're not going to owe any taxes. Um, so hopefully that answers the questions, but yeah, definitely. Um, and then someone is asking, this is Ted saying, instead of mileage, can I lease my car to my rental property LLC for the deduction? <laughs> you could, but um, keep in mind when you lease to yourself, you have also lease income, right? So I have a lease expense on my rental and I personally will have lease income because I've earned money from leasing my so it's not a strategy we typically recommend to people unless you have some special circumstances. I mean, yeah, with respect to auto expenses, there's, you know, I think what he's kind of alluding to, there's there's two different methods, right? You can take the standard mileage write off, which is how many miles I drive for business times the rate. That's my deduction. Or you can add up your actual costs and take the business use percentage of those as a deduction. Uh, and lease expense, if you were leasing your vehicle, could be included in that. But still, if you were using that method, at the end of the day, you still need to know what the business use percentage of your vehicle was. And that's going to be based on the number of miles you drove for business versus your overall miles. So you still need to track your miles in that second example anyway. Um, so and typically with auto expenses, we tell clients to kind of keep track, obviously keep track of your miles, keep track of your actuals. And then when you get the tax return time, uh, as part of the tax return, you can run an analysis to see which deduction is bigger and then take the bigger one. Great. Excellent. Thank you. And then um, my CPA put us into an accelerated depreciation program on our last two property purchases. Your general message is that it's typically best to not do that, correct? So this is Ange asking for some clarification. Um, no, I mean, I think uh, we typically recommend taking accelerated depreciation, um, especially if you can use it to offset taxes from different sources of income. Uh, which is, you know, rental income where if you're eligible to do it off of W-2 income as well. So um, generally we do recommend taking accelerated. I don't know if this is talking about like 2024. Um, so so what we were saying right now, because uh, the current law is we can take accelerated depreciation and do 80% bonus. So the suggestion was let's hold off on filing our tax return because they may change the law to allow us to do 100% bonus for last year's taxes. So that's they don't do it, just hold off until we know more because you might get an even better accelerated depreciation. So we're kind of nearing the end of our hour. I think we'll do one more question. Um, and then again, all you guys, this is going to be recorded. You'll get a copy of the recording in your email. And then any other questions, I'm taking notes of them so I can send them to Amanda and Matt for them to follow up with you guys directly. Um, so we have, can we rent our own personal property to our business? Can that rental income be received tax-free for a period of time? And what is the reasonable rate to rent our own property for? For example, mm -hmm. renting our personal property to our LLC for our company party or to use for another business-related event. Yeah. So I'll assume you're talking about your primary home um, because yeah. it's a little different scenario for talking about renting like a commercial building to your business, right? Your operation business. So if we're talking about primary home, this is called the uh, Augusta rule. Um, and, and basically the Augusta rule says that for your primary home, you can rent it to anyone, including yourself or your, your entity for up to 14 days. And that rental income would be tax free. 
So an example is if I have an S corporation, you know, Keystone CPA, and I wanted to host a party for my clients or my staff, uh, or I wanted to have fly people in and, and I'm going to teach a conference at my home, I can have my company pay me uh, whatever the reasonable amount is for, you know, X number of days of rental. And the result is it's a deduction to my company, uh, but the income that I earn is going to be tax-free. So this is a really great strategy for those of you who have a separate business, um, but also like, you know, your your house is one that warrants, you know, a place for you guys to. Yeah, I mean, you'll see this like people do this, they'll, they'll rent out their house for weddings, um, you know, out here in Southern California on the- in Photo the, shoots, we yeah, have a lot, and we have a nice house. <laughs> there's like, you know, concert festivals where you have a house out in that area, you can rent it out for up to two weeks or a week for that. It can, this can be tax-free tax free money you receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for yourself, if you're doing it for yourself, you do want to make sure you have a corporate, you know, like a different entity. So meaning like we don't want just KC leasing from KC, we want to have like rent type direct, so it's a different business because it's so hard for you to substantiate why I'm leasing for myself to meet with myself, right? That's <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm already confused. And <laughs> cool. so then I, I would not. I make I'm thinking point. about like our the, the landlords or the um, operator owners who maybe are hosting like a a social event or meet up with other landlords of the area or like a mini training session or something. So like, oh, for sure. And I do I then need to be an LLC? That is renting my own property to host this. Event. No, no. You just like you said. You yeah. If you have if somebody's got a nice enough property, where they can do that. and They can host an event, and you know, it, and it's an event that's for that other business. Uh, that business can pay rent to you. Uh, that can be tax free as long as you do it for fourteen days or less during the year. Yeah, and it's a pretty strict number. So, like, if once you hit fifteen days, then all those income yeah, is taxable. It's not prorated. Right now. Yeah, so it's not like if only day fifteen is taxable; it's now all those days. And um, how do you figure out like the the dollar amount to pay for those rental days? I would look at comps. So, if I were to instead rent uh, another mansion or a hotel conference room, like what would that look like? And that's how you determine what it is. Excellent. Well, do you guys want to do one more question, or should we wrap this up? Uh, yeah, I think I saw one earlier. I can't remember who it was from, okay. but someone was asking about the scenario we talked about uh, with uh, the client being able to write off all of those expenses and depreciation against income um, on, you know, how that was possible if their income was over 150 because there are limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an example where, like, you have to make sure you talk to your tax person before you form an LLC, do a cost segregation because everyone's going to be a little bit different. Um, in that specific client scenario, uh, I said earlier, you know, one spouse was a high income worker getting a W-2 job. The other spouse was the one who did real estate. So she was responsible for all the real estate activities. She qualified as a real estate professional uh, for IRS purposes. Like she wasn't a realtor or anything, but she just qualified as a real estate professional. And so when one spouse is a real estate professional, you can then use the rental losses against W-2 income, even if you make over 150000 um, and if this is, if real estate professionals kind of like a new term to you, we talk a lot about that in our book and also in our free uh, downloadable toolkit on our website too. Okay. Well, thanks again, Amanda and Matt. If you guys wanted to end with one little tidbit for our um, guests to walk away with, any final words of advice as they get ready for this tax season that we're all headed into? Yeah, I think we kind of, uh, I, I go back to something we mentioned earlier, just keep that open line of communications with your tax team, with your your overall team of advisors, right? Whoever that may be, legal, asset protection, estate planning, just keep an open line of communication and share and keep them updated as frequently as, as you can, because um, that's going to help drive uh, significant results for you. Yeah, and I would say... Um you know, take action. Uh, Cause I, I think tax, you know, tax law favors real estate investors. That's not a secret. You probably all knew this before coming onto our webinar today, but I think where people get hung up is like, well, how do I do it? What do I actually have to do? Uh, and so just make sure you take the time to do it, whether it's reading our book or talking to your tax person and scheduling a meeting, uh, make sure you do that. And, um, you know, just get yourself educated. It doesn't mean you have to become a CPA, but you want to know enough so you can ask the right questions. Excellent. Well, thanks again for joining us today. For those of the questions that we didn't get to, we'll make sure to follow up via email and look out for the recording.
Thanks so much, Amanda and Matt. And I'm sure you guys are super busy this time of year too, but we appreciate all the value you provide our clients and all the landlords and real estate investors out there. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Casey. That was fun. Thank you.